Hello everyone. I'm very excited. Today we are going to meet uh, Eleftheria Espetanaki. I know Eleftheria since some years now. I There was the time she was doing her master on IP a competition at Max Planck Institute. And she already was clearly one of the brightest students. She was the one raising the right questions. And she approached me at that time because she was writing on the Internet of Bodies and she wanted to know about the topic of standards. And this is how, how we met. And in the meantime, she is working as researcher, uh, supporting the uh, IPR policy team at Ericsson. And yeah, that's why I invited her because the topic of the Internet of Bodies sounds super exciting. And I thought maybe we can hear from, from her. So I'm going to let her uh, explain you everything and request her to join. Let's see if it works out. Hello, Eleftheria. Hello, Claudia. Hi, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I was explaining a bit about the, um, the your career path very quickly, just that we met in the time of the master and, and that you were already raising questions on the topic of standards, clearly interested, um, and that you're now supporting the IPR policy team at Ericsson. But I would like us to know, maybe for those that still don't know you, can you tell us a bit your career path? How did you start? How does it come? Until where you are. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I I am Elisaria. I am a Greek lawyer, uh, and I started my career in a Greek law firm. And then I it was the first time that I met IP uh, professionally, and I was amazed by by how uh, law and technology can basically merge, and yeah, and and the questions that are raised in the legal context. So I decided to pursue my master's in intellectual property and competition law. I did. I finished my master's in Munich, uh, in the uh, Munich Intellectual Property Law Center, which is uh, uh, supported by the Max Planck Institute. And then uh, I did my uh, my internship in Ericsson, uh, amazing internship, <laughs> and I learned a lot of things about standards. My master thesis also was. Uh, uh, related to standardization, and this is my career path. Basically, I, I'm working uh, with standards since 2019. Uh, yeah, and here we are now. <laughs> yes, very exciting path. So you were telling us about the uh, the master thesis that it was about the Internet of Bodies. Can you explain what the Internet of Bodies or IOB is about for those who are not familiar? Yes, so uh, essentially the Internet of Bodies is a subclass of the Internet of Things. Probably most of you have heard about the Internet of Things. It's uh, basically the devices around us that are connected to the Internet. Uh, and you can, uh, the, every person can basically uh, control a device through the Internet or the, the, the devices themselves can, can communicate and make our lives easier. So this uh, context is transferred to the human body. And this is actually a very exciting concept. Uh, it's uh, uh, a network of bodies that co are connected to the Internet, are heavily, re uh, are heavily relying on Internet connections and also other technologies such as artificial intelligence. Uh, so imagine a, a network of, of devices and then imagine a network of bodies that can communicate with each other. I mean, this is kind of exciting. It's it's like an, a mobile network, but on your on your body, which is I mean, it's kind of uh, futuristic, but also very exciting, I think. Sounds like a, a little bit like this fiction uh, movie yes. that it's not kind of real, but it is real. So can you give us some some examples um, of, of IOB and also maybe some applications so that we can visualize a bit what is this about? Yes, so uh, firstly, I would like just to, to make a, a distinction to uh, make more clear how IOB is uh, categorized. So uh, the IOB is uh, Internet of Bodies, which is the abbreviation IOB. It's a term that was, I think it was introduced by um, a professor, Andrea Motwissin, 
if I'm not mistaken about the pronunciation. She wrote the paper on the Internet of Bodies, I think in 2000, I, re I read it in 2018, 19. So, I mean, it was not very, very old. Um, and she introduced this term and she, uh, she made the categorization, a distinction of three generations. Uh, first, second, and third generation of IOB. So the first generation were the, the devices that you can basically uh, attach to your body, uh, or th this distinction was based on proximity to the human body. So the first uh, generation was the wearables, uh, some devices that you can put on your body, but they're not invasive. So the second and the third generation were the invasive devices. The second is the things that you uh, embed in your body. And the third generation, which is the most, the most science fiction-like, is the ones that are melted in your body. So this is a, a one uh, ca category of IOB. And the second make, made on the, um, mostly based on the substance, let's say it's the medical and non-medical this is a, a very uh, i don't know it's a very uh, broad categorization medical most people can understand non-medical entails whatever is not medical basically it can be for recreational reasons for communication reasons so i mean just to have a broad um uh, a brief yeah, uh, categorization of these devices so uh, an example a very uh, uh, everyday life example is the wearables. Uh, probably everyone now has an Apple Watch or a Fitbit. These are IOB devices. I mean, you probably are like taken aback. Oh my God, do I use an IOB device? Yes, you do. Um, another device might be, for example, uh, a pacemaker uh, uh, that is connected to the internet, which is, uh, I mean, it seems also a bit surreal, but this actually happens, or uh, an insulin pump that is connected to the internet and can regulate the doses. So you don't need to actually administer yourself the insulin, uh, the insulin but it, it, it's it becoming automated basically. So there are also a lot, I mean, a million devices that can be connected and they are connected. For example, smart onesies for children or uh, we, can, we will also uh, talk about the more futuristic and the ones that are not yet here or there in a research level, such as the brain interfaces, brain to computer, brain to machine, brain to brain. So these are also IOB devices. Okay, you were talking before about invasive. Mm. Do you mean that they are kind of within your body? Or? Yes. They are connected basically to your nerves and your bones. For example, the prosthetic arm. Now, uh, nowadays, the prosthetic arm for a person that has lost, I mean, uh, her, her arm, it's not only just, we just put a, like a, a plastic uh, prosthetic and that's it. Now you have so many possibilities. It can be connected to the internet. You can have so many, so many applications in this, in this device. So these that are in, I mean, they are one with your body after some time. These are the invasive ones. Yeah, there are also some devices, invasive devices that are even more futuristic, for example, a, a cochlear implant that can be in your head or an interface, a brain interface that can help, for example, uh, patients with Alzheimer's or, or Parkinson. And yeah, and these are indeed melted into your, uh, or will be melted probably, blended into your in, into our body. So yeah, I mean, this is, this is the invasive and this is where also the, the risks and the problems start, but also it is very exciting. Indeed, that sounds amazing. But before we go into these benefits and risk, maybe the audience will benefit from knowing what is the role that the standards are playing here? So uh, standards, I mean, uh, for the audience, I, I, I mean, probably the audience is not very familiar, but will uh, will become familiar with the standards. Uh, and is, is familiar with standards in the in everyday life without even realizing. So we are using our phone, we are using, uh, for example, our Wi-Fi, all of these are standards. And uh, the Internet of Bodies basically is the epitome of standards because we are using the Internet in whichever form, e even if it's a cellular form or Wi-Fi form, we are using the Internet. So these devices uh, are expected and are, are currently using the Internet 
the most simple of them, for example, a Fitbit, a, wear, a wearable device, is using the internet both in our home and outside through these uh, standards to connect. This is the basis of the of the of the IoT and the IOB. So uh, standards, cellu cellular standards, for example, that the ones that we use when we are not at home, uh, the ones that we use when we do whatever we do in our lives, basically every day. Uh, 3G, 4G, and 5G. Now that it's it's becoming a big big thing, and it's going to be uh, a big thing for Internet of Bodies. These are the ones that generate all of the benefits and, gen and give give life basically to IOB. So these are uh, yeah, they, they they make IOB function. And for the audience, I mean, some of you already know about standards that they are of rules that guidelines that companies follow in order to make the devices, uh, product services interoperable. This is what it makes to have every time highest performance, that we have connectivity, that um, that the transfer of data is then faster, more reliable. And I imagine, especially when we are talking about health issues or security issues, we do need things. <laughs> really need the information to, to 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 transfer very very quickly and i imagine this is where, where we see 5g having a, a much stronger role as each g each generation is an improvement uh, of the previous one yeah i mean uh it's yeah as you said 5g is gonna revolutionize basically iob because now with 4g we know that uh, the medical uh, internet of bodies uh, through telemedicine most people know telemedicine as a war as a as a term uh, a doctor for example can monitor uh, the uh, here patients uh, they can monitor for example if the if the patient has ingested a, a smart pill that can monitor uh, her health and her condition the doctor can actually monitor that through 4g but no operation, no surgery can happen actually with 4G because there are a lot of, I mean, nobody can depend on that right now when we talk about human lives. But 5G is going to revolutionize that and we're going to be able to do much more things. Uh, and, and yeah, and it, it will bring everything to the next level. Actually, all of the more futuristic devices that we are talking about probably will be in a in a very uh, in a functional level with 5G, for example, the brain interfaces, uh, yeah, which is more. I mean, 5G is more reliable, it's faster, uh, and yeah, I, I mean, it's gonna be a, a new a new phase for the Internet of Bodies. Great. So we were talking, or you were talking about medical and non-medical IoB devices. Can you tell us a bit about benefits of of using IoB devices? Sure. Uh, so I think the medical IOB devices are the one that are the ones that bring the most benefits, at least evidently. So we're going to see people uh, that have impairments, as we said, and disabilities using prosthetic arms, prosthetic legs. They might use, for example, um, uh, eyes inter uh, that have that are connected to the internet. Uh, we are using insulin pumps for people that might have illnesses and uh, 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 insulin pumps, for people that have diabetes. Uh, as we said, again, uh, pacemakers that are connected to the internet for people that have heart disease, heart conditions. And then we are going uh, deeper, let's say. We, we have deep brain stimulator, stimulators for people with Parkinson diseases. These, uh, I mean, this, the last uh, example, is uh, one, I think it is used actually now. It was in a research uh, level, but now it has it started it, ha it has started to being used in people and it has shown great benefits. So, uh, I mean, these devices bring new life to people. I mean, we can say that, that they, 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 they enhance their abilities. Uh, even when their, their abilities are impaired, they they bring them back to to what they they should be let's say uh, and they they help them they facilitate their everyday life and uh, 
and even for for people that um, for example might have uh, diabetes that okay it's not it is a, it is a very dangerous um condition but they they i mean they experience no impairments in the everyday life let's say uh, for example to walk properly but they have uh, their own concerns about uh, their insulin levels uh, should we get uh, an injection should we not get an injection so these things are much more easy their life is getting easier and easier and they do not need to go to the doctor every uh, five minutes they don't need to have a person to uh, inject uh, an insulin pump every uh, every day so i mean their life is getting much much more easier and this is what technology is all about basically it's for making the uh, the life of consumers easier happier i mean and now we are talking about health so apart from uh, uploading a, a picture on instagram or talking with my friends that are on the other side of the globe technology can bring so much more to people so i think this is what iob is about but also the non-medical devices because Okay, the medical can help so many people, but also uh, the non-medical devices can bring a lot of benefits. So, I mean, we don't, we, we will not need, for example, our phones, maybe in some years. I mean, this was my prediction because I, I read my thesis again, and this was, I had this uh, kind of thought that maybe in 50 years or 100 years, uh, mobile phones will be, smartphones will be redundant. I mean, maybe this will be true, maybe it's not. I mean. I hope we are here to see it. Maybe not. Who knows? But yeah, I mean, so yeah, hundred years. I hope. I mean, maybe we will become uh, IOB cyborgs, like really cyborgs. So yeah, but I mean, you can get so many benefits from all of this. Uh, all of this, uh, um, and yeah, you can monitor your health. You can monitor your uh, your sleeping patterns. There are so many, so many applications now, so many startups uh, worldwide that are, are, are researching on that. They are, there are so many uh, applications for, for example, for COVID now. COVID has made a huge boom in uh, IOB uh, for sleeping patterns or for uh, predicting a, a heart attack or uh, help you regulate your, your, uh, your, your, um, your diet. I mean, so many, uh, also not uh, strictly medical, but general wellness applications. So yeah, I think the benefits are are so many and yeah. I see you're super excited about Yeah, I am very things. excited. And, and I have to say it's, it's very contagious. I'm, I'm like, yes, yes. Let's <laughs> do it. <laughs> yes, so, um, but you know, you were talking about the, the bright side of the technology, we know each technology um, may have, not necessarily, but may have some risks or at least some challenges. Could you also elaborate on, on this part? So, of course, as I said also before, there are some risks, uh, even from the most basic devices. But as we go uh, further into the human body, as we go further to the generations of IOB, we have more more issues to face so uh i would i would start with one that it's it's more related to the phys physically to the human body for example uh, it is uh, biohacking so this is a, a huge concern in the community of iob and in and human enhancement for people that uh because the device might be very expensive or because they want to uh experiment with uh, a lot of devices and they want to become human cybers they are starting to uh to use unauthorized for example devices devices that are a diy they made themselves so this is a, a huge deal in this um in this community of people that are striving for the enhancement but i mean this is one part that i don't know how, i mean it is not clear yet how this can be uh, addressed but the, the things that probably can be addressed, and they are risks that are very grave, to, to, to be honest, is uh, privacy and cybersecurity. Uh, so, I mean, it is it is uh, very uh, yeah. It makes sense that when when a device into your body, a, a device that has access to the internet, this device is gonna have access to a lot of data. 
personal data, sensitive health data. So, and, and, and it is one part of the device. It is it, its function in its core to generate this data, to transmit, to produce this data. So this is not harmful per se, of course. I mean, this is why you have the device in the first place. But the risks that, are, that this device bears, for example, is uh, if this, um, this device is hacked uh, through the use of internet, or if there is a leak or a data breach. So there, this, I mean, privacy and that data, data uh, protection is the most important part of um, the most important risk, the most important issue that is raised now in the Internet of Bodies. Uh, for example, in 2018, there was a, I, re I remember there was a university in, in Germany, I think in Münster, that uh, had a, that I concluded their research that uh, yeah, the conclusion of the research was that uh, uh, several uh, children's smartphones could be hacked so easily and people could, for example, track the location of the children and send even voice messages. So these there are risks that are here and this might not have happened, for example, but this is a very real risk and a very real danger. I mean, if we are talking about kids, this is even more, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, it is. It is even more like terrifying for for people, but still for everyone. So this is where now techno. I mean, technology developers and uh, researchers and innovators need to focus so that people can actually use the IOB devices without having so much. Uh, I mean, concerns. Concerns. The concern will always be concerns, of course, but just to feel that you are more secure and yeah and your private data are going to be transmitted to the person that needs that. I mean, they're supposed to be transmitted. Yes, that's very, very important. People are, as you say, in security aspects and, and people's life and children in being impacted. Of course, I, uh, I wonder because, you know, you're a lawyer, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> so maybe some in the audience are also lawyers. I would like to, to understand what is the link with IP with intellectual property. Uh, how is how is the Internet of Body related to intellectual property? And uh, yeah, what can you tell us about this? Yeah, so uh, of course the Internet of Bodies, the devices themselves are in inventions, most of them, and I mean probably all of them. So this is where IP comes in and yeah, and ties in basically. So we have a lot of patents that are um, uh, a lot of a lot of patenting technologies in these devices and this is what i mean this is what we are expecting basically from from uh, companies from the innovators for 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 them to bring us newer stuff uh most exciting more exciting and yeah and things that we can uh, use in the future and can be uh can be um i don't know uh, groundbreaking. So this is where patent patents come in to IOB. And as we said before, standards are a great uh, part of IOB because they they basically sustain the, the network that IOB is, uh, or IoT and IOB. So we have standards, cellular standards that create the, the network and, and are providing the connection, the connectivity and interoperability between these devices. Uh, so we also, uh, I mean, the, the 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 goal is to have even more specific standards for IOB, either medical or non-medical. And these standards, of course, are going to include patents. Patents are going to read on these standards. So this is what we expect from uh, technology developers to bring their inventions into the standards. And we we're going to have standard essential patents that are going to read on the on this specific IOB standards. Uh, so IP specialists, lawyers that are, are uh, uh, engaging with this with this specific uh, sector are going to be uh, very. I mean, they're going to be very engaged. I think in the future with IOB through all of the uh, the licensing that's going to be uh, that's going to be needed for these devices. As we know now, uh, cellular standards 
and uh, the, the, the standard essential patents that read on these standards are available, are accessible in uh, front terms and fair reason and non-discriminatory. So this is something that is actually um, very beneficial for IOB itself because it's going to be very, uh, very um, accessible also to consumers. As I said before, the biohacking, one of the most important reasons why people are actually do it, I mean, use do it yourself devices is because they cannot afford them. But if you imagine uh, devices that have all of these technical capabilities that are in affordable prices, I mean, this is extraordinary and this is something that uh, will change how people communicate with each other. And this is actually possible and it can be facilitated through uh, cellular standards that are going to be more specific and I mean, how the framework is now uh, structured, let's say. Yeah, so I, I think that uh, when you're talking about uh, access on fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory terms and conditions, what we know on the front, I, I understand that this will, will allow consumers to have affordable IOB devices and then intensify all this innovation as it has done with the cellular standards. That's why we, we can afford to have uh, our phones, basically. And, and there's a lot of uh, innovation behind that that many consumers are not aware uh, of. But now coming back into because we were talking, you were talking about these uh, these risks and and of course, uh, I was. Uh, I think everybody was busy <laughs> children and strangers uh, contacting them and so on. Um, and also having the, the data, the own data for whatever commercial uh, uses or, or being sold to insurance companies. Uh, I don't know how many other horror scenarios. So you tell us which solutions have you heard that uh, people are proposing? Is it regulation? the right way, because if it's uh, so sensitive issues that impact uh, health and data protection and safety, how are we going to solve this? So uh, indeed, um, the solution is, I mean, it's not, uh, it's not clear yet and people have, uh, there are a lot of things that have been said and have been suggested, um, but I, I personally believe that uh, a regulation in, might be helpful, but it might need more time and more uh, more effort to be uh, to be proposed and in the end to to become a reality. I mean, there are so many things that are need to be taken uh, into consideration, and there's a it is a very technical topic. Uh, now uh, the Commission has already a regulation about um, medical devices. Uh, which, I mean, touches upon some parts, uh, but it's not uh, IOB specific, of course. It, I think it was, it's a regulation for 2017. Uh, I mean, there's also the data protection regulation, GDPR, as we know, that can fit in, but it doesn't actually um, address all of the problems. So there is a mix and match of different regulations, but in my view, I think it's, it's, it's more... Um, realistic to expect from the industry to do something. For example, uh, these specific standards, they can be, uh, they can be developed from uh, people that actually know the technology, they, they have first-hand um, uh, access uh, and first-hand experience from the problems, the technology, and the problems that might come from the technology. And to tie all of this together, uh, as we know in uh, in the European Union, we have the the notion of the harmonized standards. So this could be also a solution. For example, not uh, not generating regulation that is going to be very very slow process, but request from the in the European standardization organizations, which is I mean we have three in uh, the European Union, request from them. And especially from Etsy, which is the one that uh, engages with telecommunications and architecture, request to develop standards that are specific for medical devices, non-medical devices, and they're addressing the problems of security and privacy. And yeah, I think this this would be a, a, a actually a realistic uh, suggestion. And it, it has been it is 
it is done currently for many, many things. And actually, I mean, also one of the reasons that these ESOs exist is to, uh, uh, I mean, in... I mean, uh, in the service of uh, of uh, European citizens, let's say. So, I mean, this is one. I think this is one of the of the good proposals for um, for tackling these problems with uh, with uh, the risks of IOB. Okay, thank you, Alexandria. I feel like we could be talking forever, but we are coming to an end. So, I have two questions left. Uh, the first one is related to related the next steps in a career because you know you you've gone into this IP and competition world you went to IOB then a specialization on standard essential patterns what is coming next yes yeah, so uh, I mean I am now a young professional that is uh, uh, working with standardization but I feel um, that the next step for uh, for me, I mean, for for the world, and somehow for me, that I I chase after the the, the as I chase after progress would be to um, to work on uh, on open source and standardization. Mm -hmm. So this is the the uh, the the new uh, phase in my life, let's say, professionally speaking. So I I, I will. Um, I will work and train and learn more about open source and its and its relation with standardization and how these can uh, basically work together, have a, a peaceful uh, collaboration between uh, open source communities and standardization um, uh, standardization uh, uh, participants. So yeah, this is the the next step for me, and I am super excited about it, and I hope uh, yeah it's gonna pan out. <laughs> I'm sure it will be, and uh, maybe in some months from now you can come again and tell yes. us a bit about open source. I, I yes. think it's a very, very interesting topic, and uh, there are a lot of misconceptions out there yes. on the topic, so I think it will be great if you could come and, and explain us a bit on, on this. So we'll wait some months and then we will invite you again. And my last question is um, that you could share with us uh, one mistake you've made and the lesson learned, because I think mistakes we all do, uh, what is important is what we do afterwards. So maybe what, what was it, uh, a lesson learned from yes. uh, a mistake you've made? So I think uh, all of us have made, like in our professional uh, lives, especially the first steps we have made a lot of mistakes and mostly by waiting for other people to uh, somehow help us. I mean, this, I think this was my, one of the, not biggest, but one of the mistakes that have remained in my, in my mind that I somehow expected from people to, uh, to help me, to give me their hand, to go forward. Um, and um, this kind of, uh, accumulated experience of of people not giving me the chance that I wanted even though I expected but I didn't I didn't have the courage to to grab it for example or to to ask for it and expecting to come to my lab basically um, and then feeling uh, this kind of uh, this feeling of why <laughs> this yeah wondering what what happened there so yeah I mean it's not exactly a, a mistake, but it's a, it's a, it's a, I think it's a pattern of mistaken uh, behaviors from my side. Um, so yeah, this, the, the, the solution or the suggestion or the advice I would give that the, the one that I also, um, I also followed after some time is that you need to take your chances and you need to be bold and ask for them and be proactive when you need something, you need to be there and yeah, don't wait for anyone to uh, say, oh yes, you are a good worker or you are a good professional. I mean, you don't, you're not gonna leave your chance to others. So I would say you have to be bold, you have to be brave and to succeed also in professionally, but personally also. But yeah, I mean, that would be my, my, uh, my advice, let's say. 
and how did it change? I mean, at the beginning, you were kind of expecting from people to come to yeah. you, and then you you realize maybe they cannot read minds, and then you yes. need to to tell what you want, and then maybe works, maybe doesn't. What was the impact? I think uh, I have become more. Uh, I have become more self self aware of my my capabilities. Also, I mean, I understand now that, um, or I have accepted, for example, that I am good at something. I I I am good at my job. I am good at this and that. So I, mean, I think it's it's a self realization that you are you are worth of something. So you need to chase it, and you need to ask for for a recognition, not recognition in terms of an award, for example, but for recognition in terms of a, a chance, uh, a step forward. So I think this has changed my perception of myself, first of all, and how I am perceived also from other people. I mean, if you are if you are brave enough to ask for things and if you are brave enough also to ask for things that you don't know, I mean, this is, I think this can change also your professional life. Because nobody's a, like a, as you said, nobody's a mind reader and nobody expects you to know everything. So this is something I learn every day. Uh, yeah, and I think this has helped me. And it's, I mean, it's still a work in progress. You always uh, improve yourself and you always try to learn from your mistakes and your, uh, not even your mistakes, even though, even from the good things that you do and the other people point out. But yeah. I think uh, being brave is also good for like your self-esteem, even though you are not going to succeed in the end, might not succeed in the end. The process is what makes you uh, self-confident. Resilient. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very good. So, Leferia, it's been a pleasure having you here. Thanks Thank so you. much for taking the time to talk to us. Likewise. And as I said, we will invite you in uh, a few months when you... Yes are becoming the experts of open source so that you can be honored. <laughs> well, we see you learn very fast. That's what I learned. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And yeah, bye bye. Bye. So that was it for today. I'd like to thank you all for joining us in this interview on the Internet of Bodies. And I look forward to reading your comments and I hope you get connected because connected we go further. And maybe join me in the Instagram account, IP with Claudia Tapia. You will see it at the end of this video. I hope to see you there. Bye.